Okay, so um, so I was asked uh, to to give a like a general overview about the lambda CDM uh, model, and so so the 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 way I'm going to try to do this is to um, talk about the lambda CDM in two in two lectures. So one is going to be today, and the other one on Wednesday, and the first component is just going to be a, an overall overview of of the lambda CDM model where we understand about it um, in terms of as, as an important component of the cosmological model. And this is a distinction that I will try to, to make. I think sometimes there is this confusion, or maybe not confusion, but uh, it's common that people use these two words interchangeably. What is the standard model of cosmology and lambda CDM are usually meant to, or sometimes are meant to represent the same thing, but they are really not, I think. Uh, so I see the lambda CDM as more of a component of this more global standard model of cosmology. So in this first lecture, I will I will uh, describe that what I understand as this component and its 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 ingredients, its fundamental principles, um, the observational evidence behind it. And on the on the lecture on on Wednesday, I will be talking more about uh, the actual um, the, the actual model. In, in terms of a structure formation uh, theory. So let me just uh, begin. Okay, try to put, it's easier if I put this laser pointer here. And so the idea of the standard model of cosmology globally is to provide uh, the fundamental laws, physical laws and uh, you know, models and methodology to, to understand how the universe came to be essentially from the beginning until today. So it doesn't deal with certain details. I think those details are, are, are more of one would could call, um, uh, you know, the, the, the details at the smallest scales. It leads with our understanding of the universe are relatively large scales, very large scales. From the very beginning from the Big Bang, the period of accelerated inflation that followed that expanded the universe exponentially, all the process of uh, the origin of the species and uh, all the origin of the particles and so on, uh, then reaching finally this cosmic macro background, which uh, I, I will I will take this epoch, the epoch when this cosmic macro background radiation was emitted, is uh, like a threshold for uh, talking, I think, about the, this lambda CDM model. It is a defining epoch, it's a very important epoch, but it also kind of divides the universe, I think, into what is called early universe cosmology and late universe cosmology. Of course, different people have a different idea of what early means. So the way I would talk about early universe cosmology is referring to uh, this cosmic macro background as the dividing epoch. Then uh, from the emission of the cosmic macro background so around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that's essentially the seeds of structure formation. And what comes later is this period of, of um, essentially uh, um, um, where gravity plays an uh, extraordinary role into making these fluctuations grow. And dark matter is of course a key to understand how uh, or, or let's say to explain how the fluctuations grow so much that they allow for the formation, eventual formation of the first stars, the first galaxies, and then the subsequent development of, well, of, of planets and life, of course, uh, and everything that comes afterwards. So the standard model of cosmology tried to describe all of this essentially at galactic scales and larger. Uh, Today, right? So of course, the scale which more much smaller. So in the early universe cosmology, it really aims at explaining basically everything. So the origin until this uh, epoch, everything that happened in the universe until until the cosmic macro background. And then afterwards, I would say the star model of cosmology leads with the fundamentals of how a structure forms and evolves, uh, but it doesn't necessarily. Uh, 
you cannot necessarily attach to it, although some people might attach to it, the formation of galaxies and stars and so on. Those are phenomena that are, happen at smaller scales and that, of course, uh, involve other type of, of, of physics. Uh, so I think more fundamentally, cosmology leads with these larger scales. So let me just make a few points about that and, and say what I think is what I can say about the, a, few, a few perspectives on the, on the CDM model. So the first is the one that I kind of emphasize already or talk a little bit about it before, which is that I think is, is good or it's a, or let's say it's my perspective to split this, these two epochs uh, of the standard cosmological model in two regimes with the epoch of uh, the CMB, which is the recombination or photo decoupling at the dividing line between early universe cosmology and late universe cosmology. So what I will be talking about today is mostly about early universe cosmology, because I will be talking about the fundamentals of the Lambda CDM model. So its ingredients, the principles behind it uh, and observational evidence. So all of this is mostly about early universe cosmology, but of course I will give some observational evidence that support these ingredients that correspond to this late universe cosmology, which will be, um, the actual model will be discussed in the second talk, the structure formation model. So the, this is the second thing that I think I wanted to emphasize a lot because it is sometimes not, mm, yeah, not, not, not highlighted enough, I think. I think there is a distinction between this standard cosmological model and the Lambda CDM model. So the Lambda CDM model, I think is just a component of this more global theory, which is the standard cosmological model. And it's a component that of course is essential, but it's at the end, uh, not a complete uh, theory, is, is um, structure formation, mm, well, we can call the, the structure formation theory is fine as a theory, but it's just the ingredients are an effective uh, parametrization. So by effective, I, I simply mean that it contains parameters that aim to represent at the scales that are relevant for structure formation, that aim to represent the, the relevant physics that takes place into structure formation. So in some sense, it doesn't, it doesn't care about the model itself. It doesn't care or it doesn't need to, um, to talk about the nature of these ingredients or to explain these fundamental principles. It just takes them and you can take them as an effective, this is what I mean with effective, uh, parametrization and then just do the structure formation theory. And it is quite successful at that. Uh, and I would say this is probably, what I'm really thinking is probably, uh, probably everyone would agree with it, which is that as it is, so the structure formation model, the Lambda CDM model, is essential to explain the, some of the observables in the early universe, like the cosmic microwave background. And the other uh, point here, which remains open, it remains controversial, but I think it's fair to say that the model itself is still sufficient to broadly describe all the features in the late universe. There are problems, there are some significant problems, but whenever there is a challenge, the model always kind of finds a way to, uh, you can adapt things to still use the model successfully without a serious, uh, um, uncontroversial challenge to it. So it, this is of course very, that's what one of the biggest appeals because you don't need extra parameters. Once, you've, once the parameters are fixed with the early universe observables, you don't need extra parameters to explain broadly structure formation in the late universe. But also uh, in, in, in another, let's say this, so this is, this is something that is of course very positive about the model as an effective model. But uh, on the downside, or, or let's say the limitation of the model is that by, in some sense, by construction, um, it's not complete. So it cannot answer some questions. It cannot answer the question of what is, for example, dark matter, 
or varies uh, uh, the cosmological constant. Um, you can constrain them, or with observations, you can constrain that, that, for example, dark matter and the cosmological constant look like or should be close to the lambda CDM um, assumptions. But the model itself cannot uh, really, um, doesn't really address the nature of these ingredients. This is what I mean, there is not a complete theory. So the cosmological model it aims at being a complete theory, whereas the lambda CTM model is just an effective part of it. Okay. So please uh, also just, just to emphasize this again, please feel free to um, to interrupt me if you if you have any any questions. Okay. Okay, so let me then carry on. So let me just mention here the, the main ingredients of the model. Um, so the lambda CDM model, right? So I'm I'm, talk, I'm saying here, I'm just emphasizing that the lambda CDM model is, is, is currently the, the cosmological structure formation theory. Right? So it is this effective part of the standard cosmological model that leads to how structures form and evolve in the universe around from around the time of the CMB or let's say from shortly after inflation until today. And it has some, some main ingredients and principles, maybe I'm, I'm missing some, but the most important was the ones I'm talking about. So here on the left, I'm putting these principles and on the right, the ingredients. So the principles that it has, or let's say the assumptions is that we live in, in this um, universe that is expanding. Yeah, as I will give some, some, I will review the evidence for this. And there is the cosmological principle that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, the fact that uh, these primordial fluctuations over this homogeneous and isotropic universe we live on, on large scales, in small scales, it has fluctuations. And that's the reason we, we are here. And that's the reason galaxies form and so on. We also live in a flat universe. So the spatial curvature of the universe correspond to that of a flat universe. So all of these are ingredients that go into lambda CDM. The last one is not necessary. You can adapt it, you can change it, and you could talk about this cosmological structure formation theory. But in modern, um, say, modern versions of this model, basically the assumption is that always the universe is flat. So all of these ingredients, the lambda CDM model doesn't have an answer to all of this, or it doesn't explain them, doesn't even try to explain them. Right? They just go into the model. Uh, these are some of the ingredients or the ingredients, let's say the, the energy matter component of the, uh, of the model. And there's of course the ordinary matter energy that we know of, the standard model of particle physics, which uh, I believe was described in the first um, lecture. And then there are also these big unknowns, this dark universe, right? dark matter, which is the purpose of the, of the school and the cosmological constant. Okay, so these are ingredients. And again, the model doesn't answer the question uh, about the origin of any of these. Right? They just take them as ingredients. Whereas a standard model of cosmology or towards a standard model of cosmology, I call it because we don't have it yet, is not complete. Okay, would, would take this, uh, this model would be just a component of it. it would be the structure formation theory but you have to surround it by other theories that give an explanation to all these different components that the model assumes. So you need the Big Bang Theory and inflation together to kind of give rise or explain the early universe cosmology and explain all these um, principles here. And then you probably need other type of theories uh, to, that we don't know of, it's all new physics, right? So whereas all of, both of these are more or less say, in place. We don't know for sure if inflation is the theory of the, say, the early universe, but it has it has uh, quite quite a strong support because it can explain uh, all of these things. But we haven't really found the let's say the field responsible for driving the inflation. Uh, but at least there is a there is a well posed uh, theory, and you know there are some. Uh, uh, competing, competing alternatives, but I don't think they are really at the level of, 
of inflation, but yeah, this is not my field, so maybe I'm wrong about this. Uh, whereas here, in the cosmological constant dark matter, uh, we of course about the cosmological constant is a, a huge mystery, and there, there are of course uh, theories. Uh, we don't know what it is. We, we know that it's related probably to the uh, to the energy density of space itself, to to, to, to vacuum. But of course, there's, there's a famous problem here of the incompatibility between the standard quantum field theory calculation here or the vacuum energy density and the value of the cosmological constant by you know, many, many, many orders of magnitude. So it's a big question mark how do we explain this. And of course, the same with dark matter. And perhaps uh, dark matter is in some sense, um, the problem is a little bit uh, uh, more say perhaps one of the things we can say about dark matter is that there are many, many models that can accommodate the properties of dark matter as are needed by observations. And all of them in some sense are exotic. So they are all new, they all represent or imply new physics. So here in this school, uh, I think it's gonna be a lot of talk about gamma rays or gamma rays possibly coming from dark matter, which come in models in which dark matter is made by of these uh, weakly interactive massive particles. So some of the byproducts of the annihilation or uh, these particles could uh, could give us these gamma rays. But there are others, right? So there is this, perhaps this comes from supersymmetry. So that would be the bigger fundamental theory behind, but there is the sterile neutrinos, which behave differently. They give a slightly different structure formation theory, but completely compatible with with observations, they come from a very different uh, theory, an extension of relatively minimal extension to the standard model of particle physics. Then there is self-interacting dark matter that could be attached to other theories. There is fuzzy dark matter with some quantum effects for actually at galactic scales, again, to some extent compatible and so on. So there are many possibilities for these bigger theories that form the standard model of cosmology. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, this model itself, it doesn't need them uh, to work as a structure formation theory. Okay, so th this is just the thing that I wanted to emphasize. Now, given the topics of the school, I will mostly focus on, on, on dark matter. So I will not be saying a lot about, I will give the evidence for all these points, but I will concentrate mostly on dark matter, especially in the last, the last several slides of the, the last dozen slides or so of, the, of this talk. So let me start with, uh, with the first part. So this uh, idea of um, trying to describe the different ingredients, right? So I will concentrate in these ingredients and these ones, the evidence that we know these ingredients are there to, to or, or something very close to them, right? So first, let me talk about the expanding universe and this evidence for the Big Bang, the Big Bang happen. How do I put myself here in this? So first, let me start with the motivation uh, for the Big Bang. That is precisely this uh, observation of the local expansion of the universe uh, that you know we know uh, are all aware of. So I will just review it quickly. So this was a an, an observation done, or a set of observations, say done by Hubble and also work by Lemaitre in 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 the in the, uh, in the, in the 1920s. So here is like a modern version of that. If you if you observe the galaxies from from the location of the Earth, and you make a simple plot of the distance against the recession velocity, so you observe the galaxies and you see that they are mostly receding from us, they are moving farther away from us, and we know they are moving farther away from us because of the Doppler effect. This is something that I will be talking about more and more. But essentially, the light that comes from these galaxies is stretched because the, gal the galaxy is moving away from us. So this local expansion has been known now for a hundred years. So you look at, this, at the light from stars in other galaxies and you see they are shifted. So the wavelength of, of, of light is shifted compared to what you know in the uh, say in local measurements. So if you make a plot of, plot of the distance, you have a way to both measure this recession velocity 
and you have a way to measure the distance to the uh, to the galaxy and you know distance in cosmology is, is a whole a whole topic uh, uh, that takes takes some time there are many ways in which you can measure distances you make a plot like this and uh, this is what you find this is from 2001 but this is essentially what Hubble found so it found that the farther away the galaxy is the larger its uh, its um, precession velocity and this is the famous Hubble law now called Hubble Lemaitre law to recognize the contributions of Lemaitre to this. And the constant proportionality of this, there is basically a line, of course, with error bars, especially at the time of Hubble. And the constant proportionality is called the Hubble constant. And it has a value of around 70 kilometers per second per kilopass, per megapass. So this is the observation that we have known for 100 years. And in some sense, it's the beginning of cosmology, of modern cosmology. So just to quickly uh, revise this, what actually this observation is telling us, what, what is actually observed is, uh, is this ratio between you detect some in the spectra, you take the spectra from, from light in, in a galaxy, and then you choose some of the, you know, the spectra, of course, it's, it tells us something, it's, 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 um, it gives the signature, the chemical composition of the astrophysical object you are observing, if it's a star, it tells you something about the ingredients or the, the chemical composition of the star. If it's a galaxy, it's more like an integrated thing. But if you have specific elements, uh, basically due to quantum mechanics, we know that they are going to emit or absorb light in a certain wavelength. So this leads to a spectrum that has very distinct features, either emission or absorption lines. So this is what you observe, for example, for a galaxy. You see, say, for instance, absorption lines at a certain wavelength. And then, because you can do experiments, uh, you, you know you know the um, absorption lines of all elements because you can make experiments here on Earth. Then you know what the wavelength should be in the rest frame. So this ratio tells you something. When it tells you what? It tells you the Doppler effect. There is a Doppler effect that is causing the shift because we know that the, we think that's the reasonable thing to, to assume is that the physics that applies here in, on Earth is the same physics all across the universe. So then the only explanation for this is that the Doppler effect, the source is moving away from us. And this special relativistic Doppler effect will tell you that the formula for this ratio is given by essentially the relative velocity beta between the source and the observer. And so this is this special relativistic version of the classical Doppler effect. So this ratio is what defines the redshift in astronomy, as you, as you all know. So it is this what you observe that gives you a measure of the recessional velocity. And if the velocities are very small, like they are in the, say, local universe, then this uh, recessional velocity is just basically given by, uh, you can take this formula and it will give you that the recessional velocity basically tells you the redshift or vice versa. Well, the distance, well, as I said, the distance in astronomy, uh, there is, there is uh, a whole way, uh, different ways of calculating this, uh, measuring distances. You compare absolute with apparent magnitudes and you can make a measurement of the luminosity distance. And this is the thing that appears in the Hubble law. And then in the lower uh, velocity limit, then you get this relation. So it's a direct connection between the redshift and the luminosity distance with the constant proportionality. So this is the uh, evidence for the expanding universe. But there is, of course, more evidence that was also found in the in the 60s that uh, leads support, a strong support to, to the Big Bang, or let's say it's evidence for that the Big Bang or something like the Big Bang happened. And this is the cosmic the cosmic microwave background radiation that was discovered accidentally in this in the 60s, and it's essentially this background radiation that appears all, all around us. If you look at the sky and you notice this, as they notice originally this noise that they couldn't get rid of, no matter where they were located uh, or observing with this antenna, they would always find this, uh, I would say, uh, this noise that was going, you know, at all, in all directions. And this noise was eventually revealed to be um, a cosmic microwave background that was already predicted 
after the expansion of the universe motivated this idea of well, what is creating the expansion? Well, maybe the expansion is created by, it has to be created by something that you know originally the universe was very close together and it started, there, there was an explosion or something that happened that created this expansion. So the Big Bang Theory was then developed in the, in the um, essentially in the 20s and 30s. And then there comes this prediction of this radiation that had to be like the leftovers of this expansion. So here's an observation of the cosmic background radiation term roughly 30 years after the original discovery. This is by the Kobe satellite in 1993. This is after you subtract uh, all the other sources that you know contribute to the radiation, which happens in the microwave. And, and this is uh, how it looks like. You have all seen this picture. So I will talk more and more about the, the CMB later on. So let me just give some, some very key features that are related to, to the Big Bang. So the first one is um, that if you just take the energy spectrum of this radiation, then it basically fits perfectly with a, with a black body spectrum. So this is the black body that you learn in uh, introduction to quantum mechanics, um, and which is basically a telltale or an indic a strong indication that we are dealing here with thermal radiation by a system that is in thermal equilibrium. Or well, while let's say just shortly before this radiation was emitted, it came from a system that was in thermal equilibrium. And this thermal equilibrium, um, say verification, is what gives very strong support to to the Big Bang uh, theory. This is the observation. Uh, the intensity as a function of frequency. This is like a perfect fit to a black body with this temperature here. Here the error bars are even within the, the line. So there are tiny, tiny error bars. So it's a, almost a perfect black body. So from the COVID already measurements, so from this picture, we see this perfect black body. So the temperature of the background radiation today is 2.73. I don't put here the, I don't put here the units is Kelvin. And also over the mean temperature, uh, this is the other um, big discovery of, of Kobe. And uh, this is why uh, they got the Nobel Prize in 2006, uh, six, both Master and Smooth, is because over this mean temperature, you measure some fundamental, say, anisotropies. So the, despite the fact that this has a, this mean temperature, you can see that it has deviations over that temperature. Um, they are tiny, but detectable already by this experiment, and not the level of one in 100,000. So you have this temperature, and we are talking here about micro Kelvin deviations over the mean. So these anisotropies are, of course, fundamental for uh, structure formation. And as we'll see, it's, are the, yeah, they are the seeds of, 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 of the galaxies as we know them today. So let me here stop for a bit and see if, if there are any questions or comments. No? See. Um, Okay, so then I will just carry on. Please feel free to stop me at any point. So let me talk a little bit more about this cosmic and macro background radiation. So this is a modern version of this. So the one I show, COVID 1993, WMAP in 2003, you can see the change in, in spatial resolution or angular resolution and then Planck in 2013. So roughly separated by 10 years with another increase in spatial resolution. So there is a lot of information here that we, we have from the early universe cosmology. So it is one of the most important images and data we have in, in cosmology, perhaps the most important. So I will talk now about uh, Anisotropies, because the anisotropies, these fluctuations, uh, it is really where we can find the uh, uh, detailed information. And, and one of the things that gives uh, 
an incredible support to the Lambda CDM model. So a level of support that puts it as, as, as a fundamental, at least effective theory for structure formation. So uh, what we have here is this famous uh, plot which shows these temperature fluctuations that I have been talking about as a function of scale, so angular scale, so scale on the sky. So this is simply by the observation, of course, is, is, let's say the, what is plotted here is a little bit more complicated of what I'm going to say, but it's essentially this. Essentially, you take separations in the, in the sky. So this is the sky, the 360 degrees view all around us. And what you take is like a ruler. This is a sphere, so it follows the angle in the sky of different um, separation in angle, right? So it's like taking a ruler of different length. And then you fix it at that length, and then you look for essentially the correlations, or let's say the, um, the excess of a random noise of the fluctuations that you that you see here. So if it was complete noise, it wouldn't look, it wouldn't have features. But it's not complete noise, it has feature, it has a statistical feature. So as you take this ruler that I was saying, and you make it smaller or larger, you have different features. And there's, there's one, this first very big feature at one degree, and then there are other features and so on. So here's just a representation of this, how you, how the, the uh, plot, the CMB looks like at different angular scales. Uh, as you go from the large scales to the small scales, so you are kind of increasing the resolution as you go to a smaller angular scales, it, which means larger multiple moments. So this is uh, this temperature uh, angular power spectrum as is known, all these features contain lots of physics. So it contains a lot of uh, information we can extract and, and, and pre on predictions we can test against models of the early, basically a whole early universe cosmology can be tested with the CMB or most of it, not, not, not all, but most of it. And just in passing, I'm not gonna mention more about inflation, but inflation provides an explanation for the origin of these fluctuations. So in a, in a, I suppose I can, I can just describe very relatively quickly this early universe cosmology in a nutshell with this picture that I show here, uh, just a sketch, sorry. So you have here, as I said, the CMB emission, roughly 400,000 years after the Big Bang. That, as I said, I'm gonna take that as the, as the threshold for early universe cosmology happening before late universe cosmology happening afterwards. So the whole early, early universe cosmology is aims at describe this evolution. So it starts with the big bang with the origin here, which is of course a big question mark. Then comes inflation. So where essentially uh, quantum field theory plays a big role here. This is not that this is just a fraction, very small fraction of a second. And then after this is essentially, essentially what you need to describe all this is general relativity and uh, statistical mechanics, essentially. Of course, you need particle physics for the origin of a species. So, sorry, you need those three. But with this equilibrium uh, uh, thermodynamics, first, the idea is that you have a universe that is in equilibrium. So all the species are in equilibrium. And then it starts these non-equilibrium processes that starts decoupling the different species from the rest that are in equilibrium. So this out of equilibrium uh, thermodynamics or decoupling processes is what leads to uh, the abundances of the different species. Uh, you can talk about here, I'm just putting examples of neutrinos, if it's a hot relic or or for example, wind dark matter, if it's a, it's a cold relic, which I guess is something will be discussed um, later on. 
And all of this occurs in a background universe that is expanding. And it expands, as, we will, as I will mention in shortly, it expands depending on essentially governed by uh, the global matter energy component in the, in the universe. Before this era, the universe is dominated by radiation and after by matter. So this is another very important epoch, which is called the matter radiation equality, around 50,000 years, that creates this distinction. And it matters because as here, the, the, the universe was dominated by, by, this, um, by, this, by this field that drives the expansion, then starts being dominated by, so here the, the expansion was exponential. Then once it's dominated by radiation, it's no longer exponential, but it has a certain shape, but then after matter dominator, it has another. So the way the details of how it expands depend on that global dominance of the different components. After matter radiation equality comes photon decoupling, which is the decoupling of, of, of the photons from the system of equilibrium that finally leads the electrons and protons to combine to form neutral hydrogen and the photons then decouple. So they stream freely and give rise to this cosmic macro background radiation that we observe today. So in essence, to understand the CMB, you need to understand all of these uh, processes. But in very simple words, the CMB is simply produced or is produced by these photons finally streaming from freely from a, a plasma that is, is, is now a form of mostly neutral hydrogen after all this equilibrium thermodynamic, uh, equilibrium, equilibrium state. So let me just emphasize a couple of things that are relevant for the CMB for this epoch of, for this early universe cosmology. So of course, I'm not gonna describe all this. Um, so the first one is, okay, so what is happening to this plasma? Well, so you have all these ingredients in equilibrium. And if we just concentrate on what is happening to the electrons, mostly to the electrons and the protons are of course also there, but mostly to the electrons and and the photons, they are all combined into this, this plasma. So the electrons and, 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 and protons, uh, and photons as well, they are all combined and they are having this, essentially this competition between two processes. So gravity is trying to grow the, um, or let's say to create over densities of matter, just because that's what gravity does. It tries to attract. So because the universe is not perfectly homogeneous due to these quantum fluctuations originated here or, or um, let's say predicted by inflation, if you have these very, very tiny deviations over, over the universe being homogeneous, with time, gravity will try to make them grow. It will enhance those that are slightly larger and it will decrease those that are slightly less dense. But once gravity tries to do that, then radiation, so the photons, exert radiation pressure. So they don't let that happen. So it's like a restoring force. It's like having here the two masses coupled with a spring. So you have the masses fall into the, try to create this potential, right? So try to fall into the potential. So this represents, say, the electrons. They try to fall down, but they feel the radiation pressure from the photons. And then this pressure contracts the gravity. So it creates this oscillatory behavior in which uh, you know, gravity is trying to compress and the radiation pressure is trying to rarify. And it leads to a semi-stable or quasi-stable uh, behavior which is called an acoustic oscillation. It's called an acoustic oscillation because you literally have sound waves propagating in the fluid as you go through this compression, because that's what that's how sound is created, right? It's the compression of a fluid. And the compression and rarefaction of the fluid creates these sound waves, these acoustic oscillations.
now that's that's all okay, but because the universe is expanding, this is why I meant it was quasi stable because as the universe expands, then there is more uh, say space for also the photons to to move and everything starts cooling down and then the the, the mean free part of the photons so the scattering rate for the photons to exert this pressure, which at the level of particle physics is basically collisions that are happening between the photons and the electrons, so Compton scattering. So these collisions starts to uh, diminish because the universe is expanding to so the physical distance between the uh, particles is uh, increasing. So the mean free part of the photons uh, increases and then this process starts to become less and less efficient. So the process of, uh, let's say the radiation pressure starts to decrease as the universe expands until the point in which basically the, the scattering rate becomes very small compared to the expansion rate of the universe. And then at that point, which is the, the point of the photon decoupling, then the photons can essentially stream freely afterwards and let the uh, protons and the electrons combine into neutral hydrogen. This is the epoch of recombination. Uh, so the photon decoupling and recombination are slightly different. They happen roughly at the same time, but they are not the same, exactly the same process. One is about the photons decoupling from, from, uh, from, from say, from electrons. And the other one is about having actually most of the electrons and proteins, protons combining to neutral hydrogen. So when you put these two um, effects together, basically that's what you need to explain the main features that you see in the, in the CMB. So these acoustic oscillations that I was talking about, well, here, we're, here in this cartoon, you just see two, basically two masses and this restoring force. In the universe, this is occurring basically all across the universe and at different scales So this effect doesn't occur at a single scale, it occurs at different scales. So what you have is uh, basically something something like this at the time of inflation. So you have most of the um, most of the matter combined into these regions that are hot and cold. So you know the rarefaction and the compression phases. And by the time of recombination, you have now that the photons can decouple. Then you have this accumulated matter in the hotter regions and less dense in the colder regions. So this is what you see in the in the acoustic or in the in the peaks or in the features in the angular power spectrum of the CMB. So the first peak that you see is essentially this first compression peak. So the not, not sorry the, not, not the first compression but the scale the angular scale so there is a there is a physical scale in the problem which is what is known as the sound horizon scale. So what is this scale? Uh, this scale is the maximum distance that the sound wave can propagate from the beginning of the Big Bang until the coupling. Uh, so, so this defines this physical scale, right? Because, you know, before all the scales can go to these different oscillations. So the sound waves have the opportunity to propagate and then compress and so on. But there is one that doesn't have that opportunity because by the time it reaches the maximum compression, then the uh, photons are already decoupled and then you have this sudden loss of pressure support. So when you are in this maximum state of compression, you have this sudden loss of pressure support because the photons now can escape. So then you lose all pressure support. So you expand, you expand significantly afterwards because there is nothing to basically prevent you from, from from doing that. So you have the different compression and rarefaction peaks here imprinted into the CMB. Okay, so this is a very, of course, uh, uh, quick, fast uh, summary of, of these main features. The last physical effects I wanna describe is just this damping of the fluctuations here, which is called silk damping. It's another relatively easy to understand piece of physics, which is that 
as the photons are escaping in the last moments at the time of the coupling, they still can scatter a little bit with the electrons around and the electrons in turn pull the protons as well. So these last, if you want, moments of scattering essentially mixes or creates this, um, washes out some of the fluctuations, especially the small scale fluctuations, because the photons can drag as they are escaping, as they are diffusing, they can drag the, the matter around it and decreasing the fluctuations. So this is called cell dumping. This is why you see this, this decrease here. Okay, so I just wanted to, to give this explanation of the, of the CMB a picture, but let me know if you have, if you have questions uh, so uh, far. So uh, why, why does the peak, the first peak is at uh, around one degree angular scale? Like uh, what is the correlation? Is there any explanation? About the one degree? Yeah, why is it around one degree? In you the can, yes, no, no, that's, that's a very good question. So actually um, you can roughly, calculate this uh, position. So the, the angular scale would be, so let's see. So you have this physical scale that I was talking about, which is um, the sound horizon scale. So what would be the sound horizon scale? Is the distance sounds can propagate until the time of the coupling. So you can calculate the time of the coupling. Let me go here. You can calculate the time of the coupling of, I'm talking about the decoupling between photons and electrons, just by comparing the scattering rate, which is just given by uh, the cross section for Compton scattering, the number density of, of electrons, and uh, the speed of, 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 the, um, of the electrons, which is, which is roughly the speed of light because everything is coupled together. So that gives you the scattering rate. So the scattering rate you could say is controlled by the number density of electrons and particle physics, which is the Compton scattering uh, cross-section. Okay. So that's, that's one rate. And the other rate is the Hubble expansion rate. So here is a competition between scattering and expansion. And the expansion rate is computed or is, is, is determined by basically GR, so, so the, the, the the Hubble expansion depends on the matter energy content of the universe. So you compare the expansion rate. So this is, you say you have a time scale of expansion and a time scale for collisions to happen. You compare those two roughly, and when they are equal approximately, it gives you the time of the coupling. So this time here can be calculated, well, photon decoupling happens a bit earlier. The time can be co can computed approximately by what I just said. So that gives you a time. And now you just have to compute the distance that sound can travel from the Big Bang until that epoch. Because you have the time, then all you need to do in principle is just you have the, the velocity times, you know, the, the, the basically the time of the coupling that gives you the distance the sound can travel. And the sound at this, at this time is just basically the, the speed of sound for a relativistic uh, fluid which is the speed of light divided by uh, the square root of three. So that gives you the sound horizon scale. Okay, so that gives you a physical scale where uh, these oscillations, but by basically the physical scale of the largest, the largest possible scale that these sounds can propagate. Okay, once you have that physical scale that gives you the scale in, in distance, then you just have to translate it to a scale in the sky. So you need to know the distance from us to uh, the, basically the, what is called the angular diameter distance to determine the angle. And then when you do that, then you, you get this one degree. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. And by the way, and this is, this is something very uh, important. This uh, depends basically on the spatial curvature in the universe as I will describe in, in a second. So this tells us uh, the spatial curvature of the universe, the, the location of the peak, because it depends mostly on, on that. Okay, thank you. No, you're welcome. Uh, are there only any other uh, questions? 
So the, the, uh, the acoustic oscillations can be seen not only on the CMB, but they can actually be seen in galaxies, in the large scale surveys of galaxies. Why? Well, because as I will describe more in detail in, 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 on Wednesday, uh, these are the seeds, the CMB is the seeds of a structure formation. So from there, the galaxies basically eventually formed. So if these acoustic oscillations, so if these features in the sky, and sorry, if these features in the, in the, uh, in the distribution of, of temperature that we see in the CMB, so this is the distribution of temperature, but the distribution of temperature is related to the distribution of density of the, let's say, of the ordinary matter, and, and, and as we will see also of, 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 of dark matter. So if you have an enhancement in the density at certain scales, then that enhancement uh, prevails even until today. It's not completely washed out because these are very large scales. When you translate them into the scales today, this is around 150 megaparsecs. So it's a very large scales. So what you expect is that there should be a feature in the distribution of galaxies, an enhancement uh, because statistical, right? So if you just take a galaxy survey, like this is one, well, actually these are two, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the BOSS survey. So Sloan is in colors and in white. So this is an older survey and BOSS went deeper. So what you see here is like wedges in the sky. So here I think it's, yeah, I believe this should be the galactic plane. So you have wedges in the sky and then you just represent the position in redshift space and in angular scale of the galaxy. So it's like a map in redshift space. So the more galaxies farther away here are farther away from ours in redshift. Uh, so you take these galaxies and make statistics. So you basically see, okay, are these galaxies truly completely randomly located? So are they truly in, you know, completely homogeneous? Is the universe completely homogeneous? Um, and the answer is not, it's not completely homogeneous. It presents these features that are this baryonic, this remnant of these acoustic oscillations. And here is the show of that. I forgot to put here the, uh, the reference, but I believe this is from 2005. I think this is from 2005, yes, from this SDSS. And what you see here plotted is something called the correlation two-point correlation function as a function of separation. But it's just basically that. So you take the galaxies and you take them as being points in the sky. And then you take those points and just basically calculate uh, the deviation of a random, deviation of a random uh, distribution for, uh, for these points. So the, larger the correlation function, the more deviated it is from, from random. So th there are of course other interesting features about this, but this bump at around 100 and something uh, megaparsec, this is the bump uh, that is related to this acoustic oscillation, acoustic oscillations in real space. So they exist, they are quite, quite well established now. And let me just, uh, now continue moving on. Let me just check the time. So I have like 40, 50 minutes perhaps. So I'm around half of the, of the talk. So let me just uh, maybe speed up a little bit and talk about the uh, homogeneous and isotropic background universe. Uh, here there is. Okay, there is a question that says, um, the question says if, if the relationship is at an average level, or if we can identify a specific region in the universe and group, for example, with a specific fluctuation in the CMB. Yeah, so this is a good question. So uh, let me just go back again. So this picture here, this sketch, uh, can be misleading because uh, it, it might make you think that the CMB that we observe today is the one responsible from the structures that we have in the universe around us, but, but it's not uh, because uh, the CMB is just, um, it's basically, you just have to think of it in this, in this way. It was emitted 400,000 years 
uh, after the, the Big Bang. And then this is light that has been propagating and it's just reaching uh, us. So in the, say, in some sense, um, the Lycom of the region of the CM, that emitted the CMB has just reached us. So we cannot see, of course, the, the fluctuations that created the regions around us because the photons that came from the seeds that we actually have now, the galaxies that we have now, they were that those were created in the past and the light has of course escaped and is in another region of the universe that we can no longer see. So the CMB don't give the initial conditions for our universe today. They give the statistical representation for, uh, they, they give us the statistics or let's say, yeah, the statistical representation of how the universe is supposed to be. So the idea is that all the regions of the universe that extend farther in which we can see in the CMB, they look the same. But no, we cannot take, if I understand your question correctly, we cannot take, uh, you know, make a correlation between what we see in the CMB and what we see today because these are not causally connected. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me just continue with with these uh, principles. So this is the cosmological principle. So this is another very fundamental principle. So I'm talking about, I have to talk about the expanding universe. I talk about the CMB, the evidence for the Big Bang. This is another big principle that goes behind. And that again, the Lambda CDM model doesn't have an explanation for it. It's just the fact that at very large scales, the universe appears to be homogeneous and isotropic. So this is this notion of basically this Copernican principle extended to the cosmological level. So there is no preferred location or direction in the universe. So the physics and everything looks the same for all observers. So there is this invariance to translation and rotation. So this symmetry the universe has, but it has it at certain scales. So the cosmological principle would say, okay, this is valid at certain scales. So what do we mean by large scales is perhaps represented by a figure like this, or the ones we saw about this long tail, the SDSS survey and the POST survey. This is something like similar, but this is just an updated survey, which is called two mass. And here you can see essentially this galaxy map. Here is the Milky Way, it has a lot of details. Don't worry about the names. So these are different structures. But what you can see is that if you forget about the Milky Way, so you just map it out and you kind of blur your vision a little bit, what you notice is that um, it mostly look homogeneous. As I said, it's not because it contains, for example, the baryon acoustic oscillation, right? Which is not, not homogeneous, but it mostly look like homogeneous and isotropic. There is no preferred clear direction that you can identify here. There are some very large structures like this one, but overall you can see that it's homogeneous. And of course, when you once you do the proper analysis, so this is roughly at a scale of 300 megaparsecs, what you could see once you project this into kind of a three-dimensional picture. And what you do once you do it properly is that the level of anisotropies over a random distribution are around 10 to the minus one. So it is homogeneous and isotropic at these scales given by observations today at the level of 10%. If you go to large scales, then it's even more isotropic. And if you go, obviously, as you go to smaller scales, we know, for example, here on Earth, around us, clearly the universe is not uh, homogeneous and isotropic. In the solar system is not, in the galaxy is not. So you have to go to very large scales. Of course, the CMB, we saw that's another way of seeing that the uh, universe is isotropic and homogeneous. So what I have put here is a compilation done by, by, uh, by Max Techmark and the SDS collaboration. What you can see here is basically this level of density fluctuations as a function of scale. Large scales, smaller scales. We saw this, the largest scales we can probe are with the cosmic macro background. So these are very, very large scales. And as I said earlier on, these are around one part in a hundred thousand or so. So the, the, the largest scales, which are somewhere here. 
as you go to smaller scales, like in galaxy surveys, then you start reaching this level of 0.1, that is here. And as you go to slow, smaller and smaller scales and you reach the scales of galaxies here, uh, this is the intergalactic medium between galaxies, galaxy clusters, you start reaching this one and then 10 and then 100 and then a million, uh, which is very, very um, uh, violating of the cosmological principle. So the cosmological principle is something that applies at large scales, which is roughly 300 megaparsec. I don't think there is a, there is a clear cut on where you can apply this, but um, roughly at, at around this scale, you are talking about a 10% level of fluctuations or less. When you combine the uh, cosmological principle with the local expansion of the universe, so the hubble, hubble lemaitre law, then these two can only be reconciled if the universe as a whole is expanding. So if we say the local, the universe locally is expanding as we observe since a hundred years that the galaxies around us are expanding. But then we say that the cosmological principle is something that should apply to all the universe. So our location in the universe is not special. We are not special. So that means if we were in another part of the universe, we would observe the same. So that means that the universe itself must be expanding. So if we are located here in this, say in this galaxy, we see all the galaxies expanding. Well, it's a little bit like in this balloon picture, which is a two dimensional picture of expansion. If we live in the surface of the balloon, the universe itself, so the balloon itself is expanding, then we would understand the both the Hubble law and the cosmological principle as something that comes out of this expansion. We will also understand this redshift, this cosmological redshift effect, because as the universe expands, space itself expands, then light, the wavelength of light also expands. So something that starts here represented with the balloon is smaller as blue, as it expands, it becomes red because the wavelength is stretched, stretched, sorry, and it moves from blue to red. So you observe something here in, on Earth, as we go and observe something in a star, a nearby galaxy, a distant galaxy, or a very distant galaxy, the same line stretches towards the red, for the further away the galaxy is. Let's check uh, my time. So this is usually uh, done representing uh, this expansion is usually absorbed by talking about what's called the commuting coordinates. So you have a physical coordinate, which is the standard, uh, um, say, understanding of physical coordinate. And then you have a frame, a commuting reference frames that expands with the universe. So it doesn't see the expansion. These coordinates are expanding together with the universe. So the expansion is still absorbed here, in what is known as the scale factor. It's a very simple way of thinking about the expansion. So everything that happens that has nothing to do with the expansion, you represent it in commuting coordinates. And in physical coordinates, you know that all you have to do is multiply this by a scale factor that takes care of the expansion of the global expansion of the universe. If nothing is happening, so you have no motion, say no local uh, gravitational, for example, um, interactions, it's just expansion of the universe, then this commuting coordinate is not changing as a function of time. And then you have the, the physical velocities so you have like points attach, attach in space, then the physical velocity of those points is gonna be given by, you can just do the derivatives here, by the derivative of the scale factor by, by the scale factor. And this is what is known as the Hubble parameter that once we do this representation, we see that in principle depends on time. It depends on how uh, the scale factor is evolving as a function of time. So if we identify the physical velocity as the actual recessional velocity of the galaxy and the physical distance in this, these physical coordinates as the luminosity distance between galaxies, then we recover 
um, the Hubble the Hubble law. Notice as well that this, by the way, just defines very quickly a time scale. Right? If you have a physical scale and a velocity characteristic, which are defined by this Hubble expansion, then that gives you uh, the, the, the units, gives you a time scale. The time scale is roughly the age of the universe. This is known as the Hubble time, 15 giga years. So it's not exactly, but it gives you an idea of how, how old the universe is, right? because it's gonna, it gives you the idea of the expansion of the universe today, this ratio. That's going to give you an idea. It's, it's a time scale uh, by an order of magnitude, of order of magnitude, actually, it's much better than that, the age of the universe. OK, so let me uh, quickly go through this, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. And I want to take some time to talk about dark matter. I haven't even reached that point. So let me just uh, go quick, get quickly into this. Uh, so, you know, to talk about modern cosmology, you need the language of, uh, of GR. Although in many aspects of the Lambda CDM model, you do not need uh, GR really. You can talk mostly in terms of classical Newtonian mechanics because the system you are describing is mostly Newtonian except at very large scales. So to describe, uh, to derive the equations for the expansion of the universe, you need a little bit of GR. Do it properly, you need ER, but you can do it with Newtonian treatments and almost get away with it. But in principle, what we need to do is to define two things. So to make this connection between, between space and the matter content of the universe or space time and matter content of the universe, which is what GR is about. So when it talks about the structure of a space, that's controlled by what is known as a metric. As you know from your classes of uh, say special relativity, this, for example, in special relativity is called the Minkowski metric. So it's this unification between space and time. So to measure distances in, in relativity, you have to combine space and time because space and time intervals are no longer invariant, but the combination is. Now, if we have this is a special relativity, but in, in, in a universe that is expanding and it has matter and there is gravity, we cannot use special relativity. But if we are just talking about the cosmological principle, then the metric for a universe that is governed by this condition of being homogeneous and isotropic, then this metric, we can guess it to be very simple. Essentially the Minkowski metric, and then you just add an expansion term here, which is the scale factor. That controls for the, or let's say, that takes care of the space being expanding. Once you do it, if you do it properly, yes, this is the answer, just as likely more general. If you have, this is the whole metric, which is called the Friedman Robertson Walker metric. This is when, when you consider the possibility that the universe itself can have a different type of curvature. So what do I mean by that? Uh, sorry, I just, I will, I will describe this in a second, but it can have a different special curvature, as I will talk about in a couple of slides. So once you have the metric, then you have the structure of a space. Then what Einstein told us is that there is relation between the structure of space-time and the matter content of the universe. So these are the Einstein equations that connect the two, right? So space itself, space-time itself, is affects the structure of space-time and the structure of space-time tells us how matter moves around it. So the expansion of the universe, if we, if we put the friedman robertson walker metric, we can connect that structure of space-time with the matter content of the universe. So in essence, because the friedman robertson walker metric only contains this parameter that is unknown, say the scale factor, then what the Einstein equations are gonna give us is a connection between the matter energy content in the universe and uh, the scale factor evolution. So these are known as the Friedman equations. This is one form of it. So it connects the Hubble, so it connects the expansion rate, which is just the derivative of scale factor by, by scale factor, with the matter energy content in the universe. In the universe, so here essentially you just have the density, the total density 
in the universe, matter, energy, and possibly a cosmological constant as introduced originally by Einstein. Here I should have absorbed this one here because I'm already putting it in the row. Sorry about that. Then you have, um, so this shouldn't be there. Then you have an extra term here, which is the spatial curvature itself. So this, the, the actual, not the space-time curvature, but just the spatial curvature of the universe. So this K here that appears in the freeman robinson walker metric. So as you all know, this cosmological constant was originally introduced by Einstein simply as a way to contract gravity and create in, in, in the time to think about, because people were thinking about the universe as being static, and he introduced it to, as a counterbalance to gravity, so, some form of anti-gravity or something that has a, a negative pressure so that the universe could uh, be static. That, that's just uh, historical. So uh, you have this Freeman equation that controls the evolution of the expansion of the universe, as you see, depending on the contents, the energy contents of the universe. Now, just to, uh, to describe this in a, in a way that is more modern, instead of talking about the densities itself, people usually talk about this over density parameter. So they divide the density components by the critical density of the universe, which is the, the density the universe should have if the spatial curvature was zero. The value is not very important. You can write the whole parameter in terms of this over density and redshift in this way. This is not, 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 uh, not super important. The key point here I just wanted to give is that there is this connection between the expansion and the content in the universe. So regarding the spatial curvature, the universe could be flat. So as an, having a Euclidean geometry, it could be curved, it's closed, as in a sphere. So this is a two-dimensional, of course the universe is 3D, but if we are just talking about two dimensions, it could be like a sphere, so closed. It could be open like this uh, horse saddle, or it could be flat, depending on the way you parameterize this K as, as zero, negative, or positive. So if the universe was flat, you would get this K equals zero. Well, it turns out that the C and B tell us that the universe is flat. So the spatial curvature is flat. As in the question that was asked before, what determines the, uh, the position of the first peak? Well, the position of the first peak is mostly determined by the spatial curvature of the universe. So this calculation of the sun horizon scale changes because it depends on the distance and the distance depends on the spatial curvature of the, of the universe. So by measuring the location of the first peak, you measure the curvature, the spatial curvature of the universe. And it turns out to be when you measure it, that is consistent with a flat universe. So this curvature is consistent with zero. Why do we live in a flat universe? Is something that the Lambda CD model doesn't answer. It's something maybe inflation answer, uh, but it's not something the Lambda CD model answers. Okay, but it's a fact, it's an observational fact. Okay, so let me check on time. So I have half an hour, so let me stop here just for a few minutes and see if there are some questions. No? So let me just, before moving into the last uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, talk about dark matter. Let me just quickly talk about uh, the cosmological constant because it's another key ingredient of the, of the lambda CDA model. So really what we have is evidence, not directly from the cosmological constant, but from the accelerated expansion of the universe. And the strongest, perhaps evidence we have about this is comes from supernovae. So what, what are, what, how does this um, evidence comes about? Well, there is a specific type of supernovae, which are called type 1a, which have a very specific, or let's say very um, 
they have a physical mechanism that implies that once they explode, they're going to explode, sorry, they're going to explode with the same intrinsic brightness. So this is the process. I'm not going to describe it in detail. Essentially, you have a binary star, but the consequence at the end of having this binary star, in some circumstances, it can be that you have a white dwarf. So a star that is, is uh, supported basically by uh, electron uh, degenerate pressure, not by thermal pressure. So you have this star that is very massive, but very dense, and it's starting to, starts to eat away basically the, the companion. But as it starts uh, accumulating mass, there is a limit to the mass it accumulates. It's a limit that is very, can be calculated very precisely. It's called the Chandrasekhar limit. So after this limit is reached, then the, 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 um, this, uh, this uh, degenerate pressure can no longer support the gravity of the star. And then you have this collapse of the core, the collapse of the envelope, and then you have explosion, which is the supernova explosion. Because it's connected to this uh, physical, if you, if you want to this scale, which is the maximum mass, this limit, the Chandrasekhar limit, then essentially all type 1a explode uh, in say with the same physical mechanism. So it doesn't matter where the supernova is in the universe, if it's in a galaxy, in our galaxy or in a galaxy nearby, or if it's very, very far away, it will always do it with the same physics. Or it will always do it with, because of this Chandrasekhar limit. So it will have a, a pattern uh, that is basically the same, no matter where it is in the universe. So if you take a, a what is called as the light curve. So if you just look at the brightness of the star as a function of time, days from the explosion, they basically all look the same. So these are different type 1a supernova in different systems located at different redshifts. And they look pretty much the same. There is, of course, they are not exactly the same, but the shape is mostly the same. Then because of the width of this curve is related to the, of the, to the luminosity of the, to the peak luminosity of the curve, then you can calibrate them. So people calibrate them and then you can basically stack them on top of each other with this, with this trick, no, not trick, but this result of this correlation between the width and the peak. So that means that you can treat basically a supernovae that is near, nearby us or far away as having the same intrinsic uh, brightness. And that means that uh, the upper in brightness, so the brightness that you actually observe, they would only depend on the distance. So then you can usually in, in, in astronomy, you have this problem that you don't know the absolute magnitude. You just have the upper in magnitude, and then you have this connection between absolute magnitude, upper in magnitude, and distance. And you don't know the absolute magnitude unless you have a measurement of the distance. Well, in this case, you know it, so you can get the distance. So that's why they are called the standard candles, because then you know it's like having a candle, so you know exactly what is its brightness and having this candle all across the universe into the past and far away, but you know the intrinsic brightness of this candle. So it tells us precisely, can tell you precisely what is the distance uh, to the different galaxies. So when you do this for supernova, you have here the magnitude that will tell you directly something about the distance and the redshift, then you have a way to measure directly. It's like having observers across the universe. So it will tell you basically something about the expansion history of the universe as you go and take these standard candles in different, in different galaxies. And when you look at the data, since you know this, this was in, um, 1998, 1999, you look at the data and then you realize or you see that the universe is consistent or the best fit to the, to the data is consistent with having the presence of this uh, cosmological constant. So it doesn't fit. Uh, and you have a universe that is uh, expanding. Sorry, I haven't talked about the cosmological constant, but it implies that you have a universe that is expanding. So here it says, if the data are in red, expansion of the universe is slowing down. If it's in blue, expansion of the universe is going up. So you can see that the data is in this blue region. So that gave the Nobel Prize uh, to the groups that um, discovered this. 
this accelerator expansion implies within the within the um, let's say within all the other principles of the lambda CDM model, then it must imply that the universe has this non-zero cosmological constant. Because you can put here the vacuum energy density, the total mass density of the universe. From the CMB, you have this kind of implications. And from supernova, you have something like this. So you have recovered this value for the cosmological constant. Are there any um, questions? No? Okay, so in the last uh, 20 minutes, I wanna talk about uh, just the evidence we have for dark matter. So I, I would like to talk about this by looking at this picture, because I think it's a beautiful picture. And in some sense, I would say that it implies or it, it gives gives an impression of modern cosmology or the success of modern cosmology in a single image. So what you see here is a, a massive galaxy cluster. So it's a cluster of galaxies that contains thousands of galaxies uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope to give an idea of the size. This is roughly like a tenth of the upper width of the full moon. So in a sense, it's a small patch in the sky, but you can see here the richness of, of, of galaxies in the universe, you know, how depth, how deep we can go with the Hubble Space Telescope. But it's, there is, once you look carefully, this cluster of galaxies contains much, much more than just this. You can see here the galaxies, some of the most brighter ones here and here. Some, some foreground stars like these two, like these two as well. So what you see here is lensing, gravitational lensing, which as you know, as I will describe in a second, but as you know, it's uh, also another um, prediction of general relativity that has been now corroborated in which, because the matter energy content of the universe as predicted by the Einstein equations uh, modifies this, this, the curvature of space time, then it means that if you have um, a concentration of matter, then that's gonna bend space around it. So if you have a source that is behind this concentration of matter, let's say a galaxy, as it passes through, as the light passes through this concentration of matter, then because space itself is curved, then it's gonna curve as well the light as it travels through. So this galaxy that is behind, it tries to pass this concentration of matter, but it cannot pass it straight because the space is bent, this is curved. So instead of going straight, it, the light from the source gets deflected. And sometimes if the alignment is correct, it acts as a lens. So it creates actually multiple images, which is called uh, multiple galaxy images, for example. So this distorted image serves as a way to, using the theory of general relativity, uh, you can wait, you can see, you can know how, how much mass there is. In the, in the lens. So once you look closely into this image, you see that for example, here you have a cluster galaxy member in the center, very bright. This is at a ratio of 0 0.5. But you see this galaxy here that looks huge. It's a spiral galaxy. I mean, it looks big. And you might think, well, maybe this galaxy is also, if I'm looking here at a big elliptical galaxy, this is a spiral galaxy, it really looks big. It looks big because it's lens. It is actually behind. And this is a lens galaxy. So you can take the redshift and it's 1.4. So much farther away than this one. But the gravitational lensing is creating this, is lensing the galaxy. And it's actually creating copies, multiple copies of the galaxy. Here is the galaxy again. And I believe this is another copy or Maybe not this one, but this one. There's another copy here. And also the lens also deflects light. So it doesn't only create multiple images, it can also distort. This is called a strong lensing. This is called weak lensing. It can just stretch and distort the light. So the galaxies here looks like stretch. Or this, these are called uh, arcs. So here's another one. Uh, here are another, other ones. They are all across this image. 
So in total, Hilt says are around 300 galaxies that you can identify clearly and belong to the cluster, the many massive ones, but there are many more. And there are around 600 lens galaxies in this image here. Uh, you take that, you take GR, and then you can reconstruct, you can see how much mass there should be in the lens to create the lens images that you see. And what you find is that you need a concentration of mass of around 10 to the 15 solar masses. Only 1% of which can be accounted for the stars in the galaxies that you see in this cluster. So the rest is, is invisible. Let's see, there is a question or a comment. Yes, so the question is how can we be sure these are copies and not just very similar galaxies? So it's answering the question as well from the redshift. So you can see from the redshift of the galaxy, you take the redshift and you see there is much different than the redshift of the other ones. You can also see because you can start looking, in some cases it's very convincing because these two, you can, you can basically, once you look carefully, just by the morphology and the features it has, you can see, you can convince yourself that it's the same. Okay, so this is related, although this used gravitational lensing, but this is related to the first evidence or one of the strongest first evidence of dark matter that was done in the 30s by Swicky, by looking also at the cluster of galaxies, in this case, the coma cluster, which you can see here. So the coma cluster is also a very massive cluster that is relatively nearby to us. And what Swicky observed was the dynamics of the galaxies in this cluster. So he basically made something very simple, a very simple assumption is to say, well, if I'm seeing these galaxies together, it must mean that they are in a group together because by chance finding them together, it would be strange. So let's assume that they are in a group together. And if they are in a group together, let's assume that they are gravitationally bound to each other. Again, it doesn't have to be like that, but it would be kind of a coincidence if they are not gravitationally bound. If they are gravitationally bound, it means that they have some sort of equilibrium. What this means is that the gravity is being uh, counteracted by some form of pressure. In this case, we are not talking about a fluid, we are talking instead about random motions. So random motions is what counteracts if you want gravity because things move in different directions. So gravity doesn't have, um, say the symmetry to put them together. So what he assumes that the system is in virial equilibrium, which you know as this equation. So the two times the kinetic energy plus the total, total kinetic energy plus the total potential energy of the system has to be equal to zero for this virial equilibrium to hold. The kinetic energy is related to the velocity dispersion. So how fast they are moving along the line of sight because that's all, all you can measure. And the gravitational potential is related to the total mass. So then you can infer the total mass as you see from the motion of the system. So in other words, how much mass you need to keep, to explain the motion of the galaxies. And with Zwicky do, did that already in the 1930s, he inferred that around 90, 90% of the matter that was holding the system together had to be invisible because you cannot explain it from the visible components that are here in the galaxies, you know, he could more or less estimate the stellar mass in these galaxies and it just doesn't add up. Other evidence for, for uh, dark matter in, in clusters uh, comes from the X-ray emission. So Swicky found this in the 1930s from the stars in the galaxies. But now we know that actually most of the matter in clusters is not in the form of a star. So it's not inside the galaxies. It's surrounding the cluster in this massive uh, uh, hot gas component that is not, is not inside the galaxies. It's just, it's just hot, uh, it's around eight kilo electron volts. So it's very hot component, it's called a corona sometimes, that emits in X-ray. Because now we have the X-ray emission, we can use it to see how much of it it is. And it's around six times more mass than in all the galaxies in the cluster. But again, six times is, is not enough to, to explain uh, the total matter. So you can use hydrostatic equilibrium, for example. This is what is done to weight again, 
use the X-ray observation to weigh how much mass is needed to keep this hot gas in equilibrium. So now you have roughly a sphere of hot gas in equilibrium. The pressure gradient, so the pressure in the hot gas, is has to be uh, balanced by the gravity. And the gravity is the total dark matter plus gas. So by you can invert this formula and obtain a, a measure of the total mass by looking at the temperature of the gas and the density of the gas. And when you do that, then you find that roughly the total amount of mass visible, now you take into account the hot gas, galaxies, everything, you only account for around 15%. So again, something is going on. There is a lot of mass that is in gravitational lensing, it is in, in, in X-ray emission uh, and, and the dynamics of galaxies that is just not accounted for. Yet another, another evidence that we can well more or less connect to in this image. As I said, one of these galaxies is not an elliptical galaxy like these big ones, but it's a spiral galaxy. And spiral galaxies are perhaps the most famous or the most well-known evidences for dark matter. Spiral, spiral galaxies such as this one. This is, a, of course, it's not the same as this one. This is a redshift 1.5, as I said. This is Andromeda just next to us, our neighbor. So in the 70s, Vera uh, Rubin and others uh, look at what is known as the rotation curve of galaxies, spiral galaxies. So this is again, again, a very simple, uh, um, a very simple, say very simple evidence. This is this is nice because you don't need complicated physics to see that something strange is going on. You just look at spiral galaxy like Andromeda, and then you just use again the Doppler effect, for example, for the gas or the stars in the in the Andromeda. And Andromeda is nice because it's like a very nice spiral disk galaxy, so it's rotating. So here the stars are holding together and they are basically in rotational support. So the rotational support, the, the rotation of the stars is counteracting the force of gravity. So you look at the rotation of the stars as a function or, or, or gas as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. This is a rotation curve. And you know, this is very simple data from the 70s, but it already tells you something deep, which is that the stars of the gas maintain a very high velocity all across their distance from the center, even in the outskirts. So the farther away you move, the rotation remains more or less constant. This is very hard to explain with an ordinary Newtonian uh, physics because the visible component should decay like this. And you can understand this very easily because it's roughly essentially like in the, in the solar system, right? In the solar system, we know that the inner planets rotate faster than the outer planets. Most of the mass is concentrated, in this case, in the sun. In the case of galaxies, we also know that most of the matter is concentrated roughly in the center, despite that they are being extended systems. So as you move farther away, you should expect to see this decay in the velocity, but you don't. And again, what you need it seems to be this massive uh, contribution from unseen or invisible matter you know, around 90%. Now we know that it depends exactly on the type of galaxy you're talking about. But this is very well established. Essentially, all galaxies you can, you can look at and look at their internal dynamics, they all imply the presence of of uh, an invisible component, or let's say let you, let all, all of them imply that there's something wrong with um, just having visible component plus Newtonian dynamics, Newtonian physics. So uh, let me just see, I have maybe 10 minutes. So let me just close with a few more slides about this and go back to this image and why I like it so much. So this is again, this galaxy cluster, but it has another surprise. So the picture I showed before was this one. It has another surprise, which is that in 2014, uh, we see this spiral galaxy and here are three images of the spiral galaxy. So it's the same image, this one, this one, and this one. 
So in 2014, once you look closely into this one, you make a zoom, what you notice here is these four points that were observed in 2014, very bright. You can see them even in this image, quite bright. They are bright because the supernova exploded in this spiral galaxy at a ratio of 1.4. Now, it just happened, it was this an incredible coincidence, it just happened that this supernova that exploded in, in one of the spiral arms of the galaxy, it just, this image it just happens to be extra lensed by this elliptical galaxy here in the cluster. So this is a gravitational lens. So the cluster is a gravitational lens. Then it has an elliptical galaxy on it that is acting itself as another gravitational lens of the light behind it. And the light behind this happened to have a spiral arm that has a supernovae. And when it passes through the elliptical galaxy, the space is distorted. It creates a multiple image of the supernova, which is known as an Einstein cross, because it's actually these four copies of the same supernova. This exploded, as I said, at a ratio of 1.5, which is roughly 9.3 billion light years. So it exploded. Uh, it's, it's, some, it's called Refstal supernova because Refstal, a Norwegian astrophysicist, was the one kind of hypothesis or, or, or suggested that we could use this kind of lensing observations to, to do cosmology. So you have this um, supernova. Now, why is this extra interesting? It's just not that it's a coincidence that the supernova exploded there, but now we can say, make a prediction because the supernova explodes in this copy of the galaxy, okay? But if we have the whole lens, if we can reconstruct the lens, we can use the fact that it exploded here to predict in the past and in the future, or say to explain in the past and in the future, where the supernova should explode in the other images. This is just one, but it should happen here as well. And it should happen here as well, because this is the same galaxy, it's the same image, it's just lensed. So what they found is that, well, the supernova should have appeared here in 1995, but they predicted in 2014 that it should appear here in this copy between 2015 and 2020. Now to make this prediction, you need to combine basically everything or quite a bit of what we know about modern cosmology is GR. You need to combine this, all this lens, all this gravitational lensing effect with the reconstruction of dark matter in the cluster, what we know about supernovas, of course, and so on, to make a prediction here. And this is what happened in December 2015, they observed this supernova here. So the prediction works. And I, I think this is a spectacular example of this knowledge we have accumulated in modern cosmology and a very strong indication of, of the existence of dark matter. Because without this reconstruction, you wouldn't have been able to, to make this prediction. Okay, now I'm running out of time. I just have uh, five minutes. So let me just uh, quickly tell you, I'm not gonna go into detail. If, if you have questions about this, I can stop. The CMB is perhaps the strongest evidence also as well, because the CMB is so clean about the existence of dark matter because the features in the angular power spectrum also depend on the dark matter content. So I don't have time to go into the details, uh, but, by, by making, by having this observation, we can know in a pretty certain way that dark matter exists. And exists in a way that closes this modern, let me just recap the ingredients of this Lambda CDM model. So from this, purely from the CMB observation, so from this observation here, we can know the matter content of the universe, so this omega m, so the over density right, to roughly 0.14. We can know the Hubble constant, so the expansion of the universe, 0.67, uh, well, you know, 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Spatial curvature of the universe, so the universe is consistent with being flat. The radiation content of the universe through the um, CMB. Well, one of the ways to do it is through the CMB uh, uh, energy spectrum. The amount of baryonic matter, so the, the second peak is sensitive to that. The amount of dark matter, the ratio of the third to the second is consistent with that. 
the cosmological constant uh, kind of indirectly once you get the curvature and this one because the curvature tells you that the universe should be flat the omega total so the total matter energy co content of the universe without curvature has to be equal to the one so then if you have this amount of, uh, of matter uh, then you need this amount of uh, cosmological constant so it's another way to get the um, um, uh, indirect way of, of getting the cosmological constant from the CMB. So you have this, you know, famous pie that I just draw here by myself on the the three main ingredients: uh, the cosmological constant, which amounts to like 68% of the total dark matter, 27%. So these two together, it's a big unknown, but uh, fundamental for the lambda CDM model. And whereas the ordinary matter is just like 5%. Now, one might argue, and sometimes this question is, uh, is a little bit controversial, is this measurement here a fit, the lambda CDM model fit to the data, or is an actual measurement of the parameters of the model? So depending on who you ask, I think you get different questions. I think I, once you take the fundamental principles and you assume them to be correct, then I think this is like a measurement, a measurement of these effective uh, parameters of the model. So let me just recap. Uh, I, I, I said at the beginning that the standard model of cosmology has all these different uh, components and theories. And at the center is the lambda CDM model, but the lambda CDM model is just a structure formation model. It's just part of it. We need all these other ones to really explain or to really have a complete standard model of cosmology. So I will just close with this, a few thoughts about this. So I, I, I think it's fair to say that the Lambda CDM model is very well established empirically by precision measurements on the CMB especially. So the CMB is just this trove of observational constraints on early universe cosmology that it basically tell us that whatever whatever the model is, the effective one has to look like whatever the, the theory, the full theory is, it has to land into something effect that effectively looks like lambda CDM. So any competing model has to must behave basically as lambda CDM uh, when it comes to early universe cosmology. And this is very important, I would say, at large scales. And I will talk more about this on, on Wednesday. Now, the key principles behind the model, they need other theories for explanation. So the fact of the cosmological principle, the that the universe is flat, the origin of fluctuations, why the universe expands, and so on, require, require other theories like Big Bang and inflation too, to explain them. And the parameters of the ingredients remain the main ingredients remain unexplained because 95% of the ingredients are represent new physics. Cosmological constant and dark matter are exotic. They represent new physics and perhaps a problem we have is that there are too many explanations right now. And sometimes we kind of run out of ideas on how to really test them. Uh, Finally, just to emphasize that this lambda CDM model is this effective model, this effective parameterization uh, with, with these main fundamental ingredients that I was talking about. And I just think it's very worth emphasizing that there is nothing, I mean, the name is a, can be sometimes a little bit misleading because it is an effective model. The lambda doesn't really mean that the model needs a cosmological constant, but it needs something that looks like or is very close to a cosmological constant. It should behave like it. Or it could be other or something else like quintessence, which is um, scalar field theory for uh, dark energy, but um, or something else. But as a model, as I said, the lambda is kind of just should be understood as just something effective, looks like a molecular constant. The CDM is even more, uh, perhaps even more misleading, because um, the C in lambda CDM stands for cold and conditionless for dark matter. It is misleading because cold and collisionless are adjectives that refer to the nature of, of dark matter. 
But the model itself and the evidence we have for early universe cosmology doesn't, doesn't really constrain this particle nature very strongly at all. Um, and it really should say something more like as an effective theory of structure formation, the CDM model, what it really assumes is that gravity only interacts gravitationally and nothing else. Uh, so it cannot really address questions about its nature because it doesn't, it doesn't enter into the model at all. It can only, we can only say that the observables constrain this nature in, in some extent, but they constrain it in a way that is still very, um, it's not very strong. So this hypothesis of, that is sometimes confused, I think is misleading because people tend to say, some, some people tend to say that basically the CMB favors cold dark matter, but, but it's not cold dark matter understood in this way. It has to be really, uh, I think, specified. Specifically, the CMB constraints on this is basically very, very poor. No? So um, I think I'll finish with that. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for the excellent lecture on Lambda CDM and, and Fins. Um, are there any questions for Jesus before we move on? Uh, in the rotation curves that are generally shown, and I have seen them before, so they continue on as we have seen, but they should end somewhere, right? So like they have to drop somewhere. So how does it drop? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, they, they have to drop somewhere. I mean, you have to go basically to the edge of, so, so, so the, the idea we have right now is that every galaxy is surrounded by this dark matter halo. So this structure of dark matter that extends significantly beyond the visible extent of the galaxy. So the galaxy, for example, a galaxy like uh, the Milky Way is, I don't know, the, the disk of the Milky Way or the end of the stellar and, and gas distribution of the Milky Way is maybe around 30 kiloparsecs. But the halo itself, as predicted by precisely by uh, Lambda CDM, it should extend, you know, 10 times more than that. So 300 kiloparsecs. So what you have for the stars and the gas are tracers of the gravitational potential. So tracers of, the, of that structure that extends all the way to 300 kiloparsecs. So when we talk about the rotation curve ending, uh, well, even if it ends in the sense of that you run out of stars and gas, it doesn't mean that the system, which, con which consists of the halo as well, ends. It's just that you run out of tracers uh, for that particular galaxy. But you could, of course, use other tracers of the whole halo. For example, other galaxies or uh, globular clusters, you know, star clusters, to prove the whole uh, potential. Uh, I, I don't know if this is what you meant by ending. So it depends on what you mean. If, if you just mean the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 I understand. Thank you. Okay, so I think I think it's it's time to close the session. In any case, we can we can just uh, leave the any further questions to gather down. If also Jesus agrees on that, yes. uh, so let me finish by thanking once again Jesus and, and also Laura uh, for the superb talks uh, this morning. Uh, before we close, I would like to, to make a, you know, just to, to briefly comment on a, on a couple of things. First, uh, about the posters, once again, I said at the beginning, at the very beginning of the morning, that you, you still have some time to, to, you know, to send your posters if you, if you want to do so. But I was told uh, afterwards that uh, it's better probably if you send it uh, up to, uh, well, before Tuesday evening, okay? Not until Wednesday, but actually till Tuesday evening, okay? And well, uh, I encourage you to actually to, to send one, one of these posters. I think it will be fun. And, and you will have uh, a few minutes to, to present the poster on Wednesday, as you know, during the poster session. And also in Gather Town. And, and regarding Gather Town, this is the second thing that I wanted to mention. I think you had already um, um, received the email by, by, by us, by the log, uh, this same morning with the connection details uh, for, the, for, the, for Gather Town, sorry. 
and so it should be already running uh, um, and i just invite you to take a look uh, maybe before even before the tutorial uh, now during the lunch break you can already take a look and, and go around uh, and try to familiarize with the whole environment and in any case as i said uh, at 5 30 uh, we'll have this tutorial thing uh, this this same evening okay uh, i think this is it yes so we will reconvene the the sessions at 3 30 with Laura, okay, she will be coming back to this uh, cosmological, cosmological origin of the dark matter candidates. So yes, now enjoy your, your lunch and your free time and see you in one hour and a half. Bye bye.